tonight what Robert Mueller found. No collusion, no obstruction. We'll look at why Donald Trump might be wrong about that, but also why the Democrats may be facing the tougher future. It's my life, it's my health, so I don't care, I will do it, whatever it takes. A U.S. company says its device can help some patients recover from the effects of traumatic brain injuries. Why it comes with some doubt. We are desperate to get a fair price for our energy. And how Alberta's choice could shape the federal election. At issue is here, and where did all the women premiers go? This is The National. For a U.S. presidency marked by high-speed scandal, the investigation of Robert Mueller has moved like molasses. 22 months, 2,800 subpoenas, 500 witness interviews, and so many sleepless nights in Washington. If the Mueller investigation is historic, waiting for history has been excruciating. But now the wait's over. The Mueller report has now been released. The upshot we've known for weeks, thanks to a summary from Trump's attorney general. Donald Trump and his associates won't face charges of conspiring with Russia or obstruction. He made it clear that he had not made the determination that there was a crime. But the revelation is in the details, the full account of Russia's multi-pronged effort to help Trump get elected, how that help was received, and Trump's reaction to the investigation itself. When Trump first received news of Mueller's appointment, an official reported he slumped back in his chair and said, oh my God, this is terrible, this is the end of my presidency, I'm effed. Now, the president's mood has improved radically since then. Donald Trump is once again declaring victory and vindication, even as the full Mueller report paints a much darker picture of his presidency than the one he's been selling. Lindsay Duncombe walks us through it. Donald Trump's familiar refrain, no collusion, no obstruction, carries less weight tonight. While stopping short of criminal charges, Robert Mueller's report reveals a campaign happy for Russian help in 2016. And on the subject of obstruction of justice, the report outlines 10 instances of questionable conduct, including how Trump handled the investigation into National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, the firing of former FBI Director James Comey, and new details about Trump's desire to curb Robert Mueller's investigation. The report says the president's efforts to influence the investigation were mostly unsuccessful, but that is largely because the persons who surrounded the president declined to carry out orders or accede to his requests. In other words, he was blocked by his own people, like former White House counsel Don McGahn, who revealed the president called him at home and told him to have the special counsel fired, saying Mueller has to go and you got to do it. McGahn refused and offered to resign, telling colleagues the president told him to do crazy shit. And aide Corey Lewandowski didn't pass on a message to the attorney general that Trump wanted the Russia investigation to look into interference in future elections, not 2016. Rather than making a decision on prosecution, the special counsel seems to have left that to Congress. The special counsel made clear that he did not exonerate the president. And the responsibility now falls to Congress to hold the president accountable for his actions. The facts that are now established by this report are damning. Uh, whether they could or should have resulted in the indictment of the president or people around him, uh, they are damning. With political opinions so entrenched in this country, it's hard to know if the report will change anyone's opinions of the president. The White House is blunt. I just called it a political proctology exam and we emerged with a clean bill of health. That's not true, but many Americans believe it. This story isn't over. William Barr will testify in front of Congress in two weeks, and Democrats want Robert Mueller himself to appear. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. So Mueller acknowledges he did not establish coordination or conspiracy with Russia, yet his report reads a bit like a spy novel with details of how members of the Trump campaign pursued Russian contacts and cheered on Russia's release of hacked emails or offers of campaign dirt. Here's just a couple of examples of why that still fell short of chargeable crimes. 
So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. While he was Trump's campaign chair, Paul Manafort and his deputy, Rick Gates, fed inside campaign information, including polling data, to an associate, Konstantin Kilimnik. Now, Kilimnik had links to Russian intelligence and had a plan that a future Trump administration might give Russia control of eastern Ukraine. Kilimnik wrote, all that's required to start the process is a very minor wink or slight push from Donald Trump. But Manafort lied so much, his testimony was unreliable. And Mueller just couldn't figure out what was done with the polling data or the plan. And then there's the infamous Trump Tower meeting with a Kremlin-connected lawyer. She said she would offer dirt on Hillary Clinton, courtesy of the Russian government. And Donald Trump Jr. said, I love it. Mueller didn't bring charges, in part because he didn't have enough evidence to prove criminal intent. But even as Mueller acknowledged gaps in the evidence, he left the door open. Quote, the office cannot rule out the possibility that the unavailable information would shed additional light on or cast in a new light the events described in the report. So that's a far cry from complete and total exoneration. In fact, a pattern of self-interested opportunism. Keith Bogue spent the day reading the report, and Keith, the president, again, says no collusion, no obstruction, but is that really the bottom line? Well, that's certainly what the president and his supporters want us to think. Essentially, what they're saying is that a finding of no criminality is the same thing as saying that President Trump didn't do anything wrong, but obviously that's not true. Not breaking the law is the lowest possible standard for acceptable behavior. But the report is filled with all kinds of evidence of other bad behavior, behavior that looks unethical, dishonest, and even unpatriotic. Mueller says Russia interfered in the 2016 election to help Trump with stolen information that the Trump campaign expected to benefit from that stolen information and knew Russia was trying to help them but kept quiet about it or made false statements publicly about it. There was evidence of obstruction of justice, but Mueller felt he couldn't recommend prosecution of a sitting president, though he said the evidence should be preserved in case someone wants to prosecute Trump after he leaves office. So it's all about framing, Adrian, and Trump got help from the Attorney General William Barr, who for weeks allowed his own finding of no criminality to substitute for the damaging behavior Mueller describes in his report. You know, listening to you, Keith, for, for the last 18 months, we've also heard the president call the Russia investigation a hoax, uh, a, a fake news. Where do all those claims stand now? Well, when you look at all the evidence of Trump campaign contacts with Russia, the lying about it, the indictments, the, tring, the things Trump said weren't true that turn out to be true. Clearly, the investigation was not a hoax. But it's also clear that a lot of the things Trump said were fake news were actually true, too, particularly with regard to evidence of obstruction. The media broke stories, such as Trump's attempts to fire Mueller to get Jeff Sessions to unrecuse himself, to try to shape Michael Cohen's congressional testimony, and Trump called it fake news. But now all of that is backed up by the Mueller report. All right, Keith Bogue in Washington. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Because of Barr's public statements, there was a lot of skepticism today about how much of the report would be redacted. And at first glance, much of it is not. There is a lot of transparency, but one issue swims in a sea of black. When it comes to details about the Trump campaign and the distribution of those hacked emails from WikiLeaks, the report goes dark for pages and pages. The reason it might cause harm to an ongoing criminal matter. We know that Trump's longtime informal advisor, Roger Stone, is facing trial for allegedly lying about his contacts with WikiLeaks. That trial is under gag order, so that might account for the redactions. But you can see tantalizing tidbits, including mentions of British Brexiteer Nigel Farage and Julian Assange. Assange was recently arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. He's facing no charges so far related to the 2016 elections, but you can bet his lawyers are wondering now what's behind all that black ink. So after two years, tens of millions of dollars, endless media coverage, where did the story land? Let's talk about it with our panel, Jay Shabria, Republican strategist, former chief of staff for John Kasich, and Patty Solis-Doyle, Democratic strategist, Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign manager. I, the, the 
burning question for me, you two, is are, are we done? You know, can we, should we finally stop talking about this? Jay, I know you're, you're the Republican strategist, not me, but it seems <laughs> clear that the strategy is to not stop talking about it. Oh, I, I, we're not done. There's no way this is done. This is going to be an, uh, a topic of conversation all the way through the election. Look, I think there's some in the media that, that are saying that this is a really bad day for Donald Trump. I don't think I share that. Donald Trump gets to get the big headline that there was no collusion, as he says. He gets to uh, tweet out memes about Game of Thrones and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And then there's this big, meaty worm on the hook that r Democrats have to deal with as they go into the 2020 election. Are they going to go down that impeachment path? There's going to be some on the left that say we need to do it and push them to do it. But I think there are some that, that um, the, the Speaker of the House, it, it, one of them, say that's not the best way to go. So they, there's this uh, trap there. And um, I'm wondering if the Democrats are going to take it. But for the Republicans, is it a matter of saying, see, there's no collusion and, and being defensive or going on the offensive about it, saying, what was this about? Oh, no, no, they're definitely going to go on the offense, right? Because there's, uh, for them, if I'm advising Donald Trump, it's you got to solidify your base, you got to show that there was nothing there, and that first part of the report says there's no collusion, as they say. The second part's the open part there. That's where Democrats have to deal with it. But you're right, it's got to be a very offensive move from, uh, for the Democrats, uh, for the Republicans, I should say. And, and so, Patty, you know, as, as Jay was saying, yes, there are some Democrats who are saying, you know, we want more documents, we want Barr to testify, we want Mueller to testify. Mm -hmm. e is that really such a good idea? Look, I think the Mueller report was clear on the fact that there was no collusion. It was not clear on whether or not there was obstruction. I think Bob Mueller basically punted that to Congress. He, knowing full well that uh, constitutionally you cannot indict a sitting president. So as Jay mentioned, there are going to be some Democrats on the left who want to prosecute the president on obstruction of justice, and the only way to do that is through impeachment. But having, uh, as a Democrat who have who has been through impeachment, sometimes it can really backfire. You know, Bill Clinton was impeached in 1998. And he ended up being one of the most popular presidents, winning re-election, obviously. Uh, and Democrats won the midterms. Why? Because Democrats, you know, uh, very successfully ran on Republicans overreaching. And there are many people who are serving in Congress now, many Democrats who lived through that, knowing mm -hmm. full well that they could overreach here and overplay their hand. Uh, so Jay's right. You know, the Democrats are in a little bit of a conundrum, and we'll see how it plays out. I'm not sure I understand what, what more some of the Democrats want. They had a 22-month investigation. Uh, the ones who want more documents and more testimony, what are they looking for? Why is this not over for them? They want Donald Trump prosecuted. He's not going to be prosecuted in the courts, but he can be prosecuted in the, in the, in the public arena. But also, the other thing that the report showed is that the president and his staff are liars. You know, instance after instance, um, you know, the president over the last two years lied and now we have very clear black and white documentation of those lies. Very quickly, one last thing. Uh, one of our regular panelists, David Frum, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, posted online that he still wants to know what he wanted to know in, in 2016. That in his words, he says, Putin's Russia obviously has some kind of hold upon the man in the presidency. What's the origin? What's the nature of that hold? It's not a legal question. It's a national security question for him. So very quickly, what questions do you still have, Patty? We know that the Russians interfered in the U.S. election. We know that they interfered in order to help Donald Trump win the presidency. We still do not know why. Jay, any last questions? Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. Look, I think when Donald Trump announced his presidency, he came out there and he wanted to, uh, to really go against China. There is this uh, school of thought in foreign policy that you can only pick one big enemy of the two, that it's either China or, Ru or Russia. And I think with Steve Bannon and, and Donald Trump, they very clearly wanted to go after uh, China and make Russia more uh, closer to the U.S. And I think that's why the Russians said, we want to support this guy. I, I don't think it's much more uh, complicated than that. Okay, fair enough. Thanks very much. The report is out. The questions, though, are not done. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. And one last note on all this tonight. Congressional investigations aside, the Mueller report also revealed that 14 other criminal investigations are now ongoing. All but two were redacted. They involve potential wire fraud and federal employment law violations. 
So clearly a story that is far from over. But let's turn to this country now where spring floods are causing some major concerns. Melting snow and heavy rain creating problems in various parts of the country tonight and we expect over the long weekend as well. New Brunswick is one of those places. The water already rising there. People already scrambling to prepare and it could be nearly as bad as last year. Last year, the water was approximately right there, about three feet in this building. Prepare for the worst, that's all. People living along the St. John River are being told to get ready. They suffered through devastating floods last spring. In fact, some of the residents are still repairing last year's damage. And in Quebec, several communities also keeping a close eye on water levels. More than 1,500 properties are at risk in Laval, just north of Montreal. The city has declared a state of emergency. And preparations are also underway in Gatineau, near Ottawa, which flooded in 2017. Rigo, Quebec did as well. It's further east on the Ottawa River. People there have been told they may have to pack up and leave at any minute. But a few are determined to stay. Alison Northcott is there. Michael Gelina is trying to protect his mother's home from the water inching closer to it. So that's why we're, uh, we're putting a lot of effort, but it's worth it. We're saving our investment. During the floods two years ago, the basement was filled with water, and Suzanne Labrie can only hope that doesn't happen again. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go into to my son's, because from experience, it's better to leave now. But uh, my children are going to try to make sure my house is... Uh, is better. Here, the water is already rising and residents are watching levels closely. Environment Canada says there's a lot of rain and warm weather in the forecast this weekend, and that could make waterways like this one rise even higher. The mayor of Rigo says this year could be worse than 2017 when the town declared a state of emergency. He's suggesting residents close to the water evacuate now as a precaution. The big difference is the speed at which this water will arrive. Nobody there will, unless your rowboat is tied to your front porch post, you're not going to have time to get out of there. Firefighters have been going door to door, warning people of the risks of staying. Here I'm building myself a little uh, barricade. A but Roger Lachance just renovated his home and wants to stay as long as he can to protect it. So what's your plan if the water does come up really high and very quickly? Well, like I say, I'm going to turn the power off, get myself ready. If I do have to leave, I have my little boat here on the side. For Jelena, he can only wait and see. We're confident that the, these bags, they could just be stacked as high as we want. That's and hope his hard work will be enough to save this house from damage again. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Rigo, Quebec. Still ahead, at issue, weighs in on Jason Kenney's huge victory in Alberta this week and what it all means for Canada's political lens. And what does it take to win the Stanley Cup? The goalie who led the 1989 Calgary Flames to victory has an answer you may find surprising. And Health Canada has approved, has approved a tongue teaser that claims to treat serious brain injury, but there is a catch. My sister and her, my brother-in-law were like, are you sure it's going to work? Because that's a lot of money, right? And it is. It's not like it's not like jump change. It's a lot of money. Wait till you hear the price tag. Those stories coming up. It's being called a silent epidemic. Every year, more than 100,000 Canadians suffer a traumatic brain injury. Many are left with life-altering problems like difficulty balancing or walking. A U.S. company has created a device that it claims can help reverse some of those effects. Canada is the first country in the world to approve its use, but as Vicka Dopey explains, it comes with a hefty price tag and more than a little doubt. Dave Chen works to regain what he lost. 14 years on the beat as a cop. It all ended last July when he was hit by a car. Today, walking is a struggle. I went to see a neurologist and he said that this is it, like this is I'm gonna be f for a long time. So that was really hard, heartbreaking, but, but I'm like, no way, this is not me. So. You put it on your neck. Chen now does intensive physio twice a day, often with this, the portable neuromodulation stimulator, or PONS device. It releases high-frequency electrical impulses to the tongue, a conduit to the brain. It's supposed to speed up neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to form new neural connections. My, my sister and her, my brother-in-law were like, are you sure it's going to work? Because that's a lot of money, right? And it is. It's not like, it's not like jump change. 
The device's seemingly impressive results were featured on The Nature of Things. Dozens of Canadians have signed up for the treatment at the clinic in Montreal and B.C. Some need crowdfunding to pay for it, but there are a couple of glitches with the supporting research. Patients did score higher on a test of their physical abilities, but so did patients who did the physio with a placebo device in their mouths. The placebo was a PONS device set to low. Then there's the question of how exactly it encourages neuroplasticity. The mechanism is complicated because it's still unknown. Whether it's the physio alone or with the PONS device, the clinic psychologist defends the program because he says it gets results. There's no nothing lost really for the patients because they're getting such intensive physio that they're benefiting anyway. Last fall, Health Canada approved the license for the PONS device in just a month, but in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration was much more skeptical. They wanted more time to review the evidence, and just this month, they turned that application down, saying they weren't convinced that it was the device that was making the difference, but rather it may have been all that intensive physiotherapy. Well, to me, it's a research project. This neurologist says the FDA made the right call. He considers the PONS device experimental and the science incomplete for Health Canada to license it. Uh, to make desperate people poorer and end up with, with uh, no benefit is just tragic and we should try to stop that. The PONS device could be available in more Canadian cities this summer, and the U.S. company expects the FDA will come around. So the fact that FDA didn't clear doesn't mean that they, uh, that they uh, didn't feel uh, that patients got profoundly better. In fact, they do. Uh, the issue is they just want more information on discerning the difference. David Chen hoped he'd see dramatic results by now, but he's not deterred. He's convinced one day he'll return to work. Vicadopia, CBC News, Montreal. Up next, Rosie will be here with Ad Issue as it weighs in on Jason Kenney's big victory in Alberta and what that means for Ottawa. And later, when Revenue Quebec posted a helpline for customers, it was the wrong kind of help. So at first I'm like, well, okay, well, okay it's funny, they, they forgot to change the numbers, it happened. After Tuesday's win in Alberta, Jason Kenney joins the ranks of a growing number of Conservative Premiers. Premiers that were not part of the landscape in November 2015. Back then, a newly elected Liberal government found allies in other Liberal provinces. But fast forward to 2019 and things look a lot bluer. And some of those new faces share similar messages from Doug Ford. And tonight, we have sent a clear message to the world Ontario is open for business. To now Jason Kenney. Today our great province has sent a message to Canada and the world. Alberta is open for business. They are joining forces and standing up to Ottawa. So what does this new landscape mean for Justin Trudeau? How about Andrew Scheer? And what's next for Jason Kenney? It's Thursday, and that means at issue is here. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Shachi Curl joins us from Victoria tonight. Good to see everyone. So let, let's start with Tuesday's results in Alberta and what we think it means for the rest of the country. Uh, Chantal, why don't you start off? Hmm. Well, uh, I, if the rest of the country did not expect uh, Jason Kenney to win, uh, then no one was paying attention for the past <laughs> year and a half. Uh, I am uh, wary to say that as Alberta goes, the country does not necessarily go, but that has been a fact of life. And uh, not to throw any rain on, on tonight's parade, Four years ago, almost to the day, we sat around similar tables and Rachel Notley had just scored a historic win and an election was coming federally and that was supposed to mean great things for the NDP and Thomas Mulcair because if Alberta would trust the NDP mm -hmm. with its government, why would not other Canadians? And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So Andrew Shear shouldn't be throwing a party yet, Andrew, is that how we should take that? <laughs> well, we, uh, Chantel makes a very effective point that no one knows for sure. Uh, I suspect it's going to take a while to see exactly what this means. I suspect we may see a bit of a phony war over the next few months until the federal election is through with, because I'm not sure it suits either 
Liberals or the uh, Alberta Conservatives to really ignite hostilities. I think mm -hmm. partly because Al the Alberta Conservatives, Jason Kenney is a former federal cabinet minister. He's very plugged into the national party. He's very connected to the other provincial parties. So this is not Alberta going it alone. This is not Alberta versus the rest. There is a an axis, if you will, connecting these different provinces, and they will be consulting very closely and I think coordinating their 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 messages and their campaigns very closely. So as I say, I suspect we're going to have to wait and see exactly. Uh, how this plays out in terms of, I, I don't think Jason Kenney is going to, going to immediately launch some of these provocative measures he was talking about uh, during the campaign. He may not do them ever. They may simply no. have been for, for show. What, what do you think, Shachia? Does this, how does this bode for the rest of the country? Well, it's going to be interesting because I think at first blush, we're looking at Jason Kenney, Scott Moe, Brian Pallister, Doug Ford, this brick wall of opposition uh, against uh, Justin Trudeau. They all talk. They're all on the phone. As Andrew mentioned, they're, they're coordinating their messages. But uh, this also gives Justin Trudeau and the Liberals a lot of, call it ammo or, or material to work with in terms of furthering the cleavage that the Liberals are now trying to force between themselves and the Conservatives as they try to coalesce the left of center again the way they did in 2015 by talking about well what kind of Canada do you want what kind of Canada do you want to stand for and that's a very resonant message obviously not with the people who elected these conservative governments at the provincial level but with progressives with young women with urban voters and so uh, he's he'll have a lot to work with the other side to this too is what if it works? What if uh, Andrew Scheer actually gets elected? What if the Conservatives win the next election? Uh, Kenny, Ford, the rest of them, they all lose their elitist boogeyman in Ottawa. And then the real pressure is on them to deliver the things that they promised to their electorates mm -hmm. without being able to blame it on the PM. Well, I mean, that's that's always the, the, the downside or the, the flip side to these kinds of things. That, you know, Justin Trudeau finds himself, as, as you say, Shachi, against all these people. But on the other hand, Justin Trudeau finds himself against all these people. And that can be that can be very helpful for him as well. Can't it, Chantel? Well, uh, and, you know, uh, thinking about your map and the change in colors over the yeah. time that Justin yeah. Trudeau has been prime minister. Uh, that is a phenomenon that is cyclical, that we have seen happen every time there has been a change in Ottawa, uh, if the map was so red, it was because it was the end of the Harper era. He had to contend with Philippe Couillard in Quebec, a liberal, and Kathleen Wynne in Ontario, another liberal. Remember Jean Chrétien uh, had to deal with Mike Harris and Lucien Bouchard. That is, one, not unusual, and two, usually not a... Uh, uh, it's a policy problem for the prime minister of yeah. the day. It's not necessarily an electoral problem. Well, well, you do that, have to giggle a little bit and think about, you know, this is welcome Justin Trudeau to Stephen Harper's nightmare. There's a reason he never wanted to talk to these people towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, well, that is but true. he didn't he didn't towards the beginning either. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, I, Andrew, go ahead. Well, I wish it were otherwise, but I think it's worth noting that all of these parties campaign against the carbon tax. Yes. So, if we're being guided by evidence so far, and who knows exactly how much they played it, a role in their elections. But if we're guided by the evidence so far, that would say that, that this issue is not playing well to the Prime Minister's advantage. It is playing to the Conservatives' advantage. And if that's a precursor at all for the federal election, then that will be interesting to see. Well, and but I know, that and is, I know, but yeah. that, is, uh, that is not true uh, in Quebec. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not true in BC. No. Uh, and a majority of Ontarians did not vote for the Conservatives. But I think but the interesting thing about this issue is if you go back to the energy wars of the 1980s, it really was Alberta versus the rest. You did not have this alignment now and I think this alignment has been building for some time between Ontario and the West. Ontario is increasingly looks West for its interests. It takes some of its, its political cues from the West. It's not, it doesn't look east the same way. It doesn't look towards Quebec the same way it might have in, in previous elections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's because that's where the population is ascendant and where the economy is ascendant. Yeah, exactly. It is increasingly yeah, yeah. Okay. A, a western... F and if you look at that election, we can look at 2015 or we can go back and look at 2011. What Stephen Harper showed was you can win an election now in this country with just the West and Ontario, effectively. Do, and do that, you, will be, that will be a calculation everybody will be thinking about. Just, just quickly, do you all take that as a message, though, that Canadians aren't into the carbon tax? Is that, is that how you read that, or, or, or is that going too far? Shachi, do you want to start on that? 
I would say uh, that, you know, we noticed a real significant moving of the needle when in the carbon pricing formula, Justin Trudeau came out and said, by the way, we're going to rebate families directly yep. to the household level. You get your money back. That's not what they're talking about. They've been off message for months mm -hmm. now. They mm -hmm. come back to talking about that. I think they're able to move the needle a little bit again. And remember, they need to win in the cities. Like Chantal said, they need to win in Quebec, Ontario and B.C., and they can make the case in places there. Uh, okay, I, I want to do one one go round on the fact that in in twenty from twenty thirteen up until Tuesday there had been a total of six premiers that were women in this country, and and when uh, the prime minister was elected, I believe there were three uh, in place. I might get the numbers wrong there, but it, should should we take anything from that? Uh, the fact that uh, Rachel Notley didn't get a second term, uh, that there are no women in these leadership positions in the country. I don't want to make too much out of it. I just I want wonder, as a woman myself, what that's about or, or whether that's something we should be concerned about it. Chantal? I don't see it as a gender issue over the same period. I see it more as, as a, uh, a trend towards uh, governments becoming disposable more quickly. Yes, Pauline Marois in Quebec didn't get the second term, but then nor did Philippe Couillard. Uh, yes. New Brunswick has just had four single-term governments in a row. Uh, so. Yes, they all came to the fore at a time when uh, voters uh, throw out governments more easily, even when the economy is good and they have a good you know, fiscal record to show for their time in government. Uh, Andrew, do you, do you think there's anything, and it doesn't have to be because it's a gender thing, but is it the fact that they are not there uh, a, a gender thing, or is that of concern? You know, if you, if you take the view that maybe women do politics in a different way, mm -hmm. does that, and you, you may not, but does that worry you at all? Well, I was going to make exactly the same point that Chantal made, but I'll, I'll add to it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, historically and to this day, uh, there are fewer women elected percentage-wise and fewer that reach to the very top. And obviously, as a society, both for reasons of equality of opportunity and because women may bring uh, different viewpoints and different experiences to it, that's something we want to work on as a society. I, I do want to note that if people are saying they were defeated because they were women, they also won, you know, presumably that that didn't help them, that Kathleen Wynne and Pauline Marois and, and Christy Clark and, and Rachel Notley all won elections as women. So uh, there's, I don't doubt there are some voters to this day who will vote against uh, a candidate because they're a woman, but uh, they don't seem to be a, a critical uh, mass. Shacha, what do you see when you look at that? Well, yeah, people not voting for politicians because they're women are increasingly fewer and further between, obviously times have changed. What's concerning to me overall is just the lack of female participation in politics. When you look at the numbers of, of women around council tables at city and town halls or in provincial le legislatures or in the commons. And so, you know, I think we tend to look at uh, the rise and fall of female politicians more carefully because there are simply fewer of them. When male politicians are turfed out of office, we don't say all oh, laws, you know, they were, they were turfed out because they were men. It's just there's been more of them historically yeah. i look forward to the day when you've got you know all women leaders running against each other and then we don't have to have that conversation yes. that'll be great and, yeah, that and we should great. say it's probably on balance a good thing that governments uh, can't necessarily count on two terms three terms in power that they're a little bit more uh, have to pay a little bit more attention to the voters uh, that's probably on balance a good thing uh, I'm going to ask Chantal the last question, and that's, this is just the, the Jason Kenney reach out to the Quebec Premier, Francois Legault, that he did <laughs> in French, that was, not well, uh, that was not well received, I don't think, but what, what, how do you interpret that, given that there is no pipeline project for Quebec? That has faded away completely, so how, how should we read that? Well, uh, the, Jason Kenney and Andrew Scheer keep talking about resuscitating a pipeline that would go yeah. through Quebec. That, I don't think, can happen unless they find some political support for it here because uh, TransCanada and others are not interested in, in yes. getting into that battle. Now, Jason Kenney, speaking French, uh, was maybe not well received, but the message it does send is this is a premier of Alberta who can actually come to Quebec via uh, television, if need be, mm -hmm. but speak to Quebecers in French and as someone noted in a column today, without needing someone to translate this French into French.
<laughs> so that <laughs> makes it a bit more efficient if you're going to plead a case directly to people that uh, you are able to do that than Jason Kenney certainly is. Okay, and we'll see where, where it goes from here. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to... Thank you, everybody. I forgot to say thank you. Uh, at Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're continuing this conversation about what's next for Alberta and the changing political landscape. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And next on The National, as the Calgary Flames fight to stay alive in these playoffs, Nick Purden relives the glory of their 1989 win with one of the players who helped carry them to the Cup. 1989, first round, Game 7, overtime. You look up, Stan Smeal's coming at you all alone. What do you, what do you think? I really didn't even know who was shooting the puck at the time. We'll hear more of the stories we're watching this evening. These three world-renowned climbers are presumed dead in an avalanche in the Rocky Mountains. They set out this week to climb Howe's Peak in Banff National Park. The alarm was raised when they didn't check in on Tuesday. American Jess Ross Kelly, once the youngest person to climb Mount Everest. These are Austrians David Lama and Hans-Jörg Auer, also professional climbers. Parks Canada officials say they've flown over the area. They've seen signs of multiple avalanches and also debris that had climbing equipment. French investigators say an electrical short circuit is most likely the cause of the Notre Dame fire. And so it is believed to have been accidental, but still 40 people are being questioned. The building itself is still too fragile for investigators to work inside. It is early morning Friday in Paris and work to remove the cathedral paintings will begin soon. A Canadian man has been sentenced to life in prison for stabbing a police officer at an airport in Michigan. When Amor Fatui flew from Montreal to Flint in 2017, his intention was to steal the officer's gun and open fire on crowds at the airport. In court, he said he had no regrets, and he'd do it again if given the chance. The officer survived the attack and was in court for the sentencing. I survived, I'm fine, and my, none of my coworkers got hurt, and he's, doing, he's gonna do life in, in federal prison. Fatui was convicted back in November. The offense was called committing an act of terrorism transcending national boundaries. They give it up to Bozak, out in front, they score! Heartbreak for Jets fans tonight after leading for most of the game. The St. Louis Blues scored three goals in the third period, including the winner with just seconds left. So now Winnipeg, like the Calgary Flames, are one loss away from being eliminated. Under the excitement and fierce loyalty of Calgary Flames fans right now is a layer of anxiety. Tomorrow, the Flames will fight for playoff survival, down three games to one against the Colorado, Colorado Avalanche. So it is obviously do or die in their quest for the Stanley Cup. They've only won it once back in 1989, and a huge part of that victory, Mike Vernon's goaltending. So Nick Purden met up with him recently to relive the drama and what came before it. Nineteen eighty nine. The Calgary Flames win the Stanley Cup for the very first time in history. It takes two months of grueling playoff hockey behind star goaltender Mike Vernon. It's an unbelievable feeling to finally get to that finish line. We worked so hard to get there. Championship. The Flames the were the first team ever to win the Stanley Cup in Montreal, which was something the players were very aware of. You know, you get the thing, and, and we quickly held it up, and the next guy, and the next guy, and then we're kind of looking around going, okay, maybe we should get out of here before there's a riot or something. <laughs> but they gave us a beautiful ovation, a class act. It was awesome. So what does it take to win it all in the NHL? For Mike Vernon, it started with failure. I even remember one of my first games. I, I went in for maybe four minutes. They scored like four goals. And it wasn't a good day for me, right? Obviously. 
I'm like, how am I going to play in the NHL? Vernon. Vernon was demoted to the minors, and he remembers what his dad told him when he was about to quit. If you don't give it your all, and if you don't give it another good shot, you might regret this for the rest of your life. Vernon goes all in. He trains harder than ever. But most importantly, he discovers his own philosophy. Play with fear. That's the best way to play the game. It works. Vernon is called back up to the NHL just as the Flames start the 1986 playoffs. And Mike Vernon is showing us his stuff tonight. And he plays the best hockey of his life. Another great save! How can he keep doing this? He carries his team all the way to the finals and gets hooked on how the playoffs take over a city. Everybody was just talking hockey and the playoffs, because that's, that's what it was all about. But Vernon found out there's a downside to playoff madness, too. I'm just hitting golf balls on a nice day. And people were walking by, well, shouldn't you be practicing? Shouldn't you be getting ready for the game? I said, OK, I'm not doing that anymore. I don't want to listen to people bitching at me for hitting a golf ball. And with that, Vernon learns one of the most important lessons for being successful in the playoffs. You're very selfish because it's all about you and it's not about your family really and it's not about, <laughs> you know, I had my mom and dad here and brothers and it's like, you know, you guys, your tickets are here at the start of it. Don't bug me. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's all, it's just this bubble I'm in. Vernon's focus worked. In the 1989 playoffs, he was the very best goaltender on the planet. And there's one particular save that will go down in history. 1989, first round, game seven, overtime. You look up, Stan Smeal's coming at you all alone. What do you, what do you think? I really didn't even know who was shooting the puck at the time. with Stan Schmiel. <laughs> Today, Vernon is still a big fan of the playoffs. And his advice? By your heart out. This is just something that you've trained for your whole life, right? Now it's in front of you and just, just take it all in and go. Nick Purden, CBC News, Calgary. Up next, the moment when customers phoned a Revenue Quebec helpline they were in for a surprise. Welcome to America's Hottest Talk Line. Guys, hot ladies are waiting to talk to you. Press 1 now. A man in Gatineau was shocked when he called an official number provided by Revenue Quebec and got connected to a singles hotline. The number Jean-Francois Doré called has appeared on the bottom of the official papers he's been receiving for months. He and his wife thought the number looked a little off. We'll let him explain in tonight's moment. We noticed that uh, there, there are two phone numbers at the bottom of the sheet. You can call and get help. So uh, my wife said, you know, well, one of them is kind of weird. You know, it's like 1-888-999-9999. And I'm like, well, you know, it's hard for some people to get help. So they say, hey, we'll pick an easy number and just you know, put that on it. But I called. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and the answer I got is... Welcome to America's Hottest Talk Line. Guys, hot ladies are waiting to talk to you. Press 1 now. So at first I'm like, well, okay, well, <laughs> okay, it's funny. They, they forgot to change the numbers. It happens. It happened the month after again. I mean, nobody's perfect, so just double check proof, uh, read proof or whatever. I don't remember the, uh, the, yeah, the sure, expression. Right. Yeah, 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 proofread. <laughs> proofread, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So, <laughs> there's so much to talk about here, so little time, Adrian, but one of them is the, the, the statement that they had uh, sort of listed the alimony payments from his wife's former partner. So imagine that. You've obviously got a problem with the payments you're getting from your former partner, mm -hmm. and then you end up calling, what was it, America's hottest singles line. Yes. This seems That's so weird. exactly what it was. And, okay, so he said this has been going on for months. Did nobody else notice this? I mean, if you're having tax problems and you call that line and you get, <laughs> get connected to uh, single ladies, is that that's the end of your tax problems? And I, I am just, the, the childish part of me wants to know if the people who are calling the singles line got connected to Revenue Quebec, because that is so not what they were expecting. But we'll never know. That is a national for this Thursday, <laughs> April the 18th. Good night. Good night.